This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Y'all listen, sometimes you feel uncertain in life. We all know what that's like, feel uncertain in life. Believe me, as someone whose uh, chosen occupation is comedian and internet talky person, I know what it's like to feel uncertain about where you're going in life. I have a complete lack of stability. No idea what the future holds for me. Sometimes lie awake at night wondering, what have I done? What's the right path? How do you get through all this? Uh, but we have all know what that's like. You know, you're faced with a crossroads in life, either in front of or behind you. You don't know which path to take or how to feel about the path you did take. You know, maybe you're looking at one in front of you right now. You're thinking about a career change. You're feeling like your relationship needs some work. Whatever that is, therapy can help you map out your future and trust yourself to find the way forward. It's absolutely crucial. We're both big advocates for it. But Cho, share your experience with therapy. Hello, my name is Corey, and I'm depressed, also mm -hmm. anxious. Uh, I think I major in anxious and minor in depression, but I studied really hard for that minor. And uh, yeah, man, I'd suffered with it for years. And as a stubborn country boy, I didn't do anything about it. And then one day it started affecting my life. And I was like, well, by God. And then I heard about better help. And uh, that really took all the excuses out, which was like, I don't want to, I don't have time to go to a place. I don't like going to a place. And uh, being able to do it on the internet really, really, Really helped and I'm telling you obviously the medication is great the therapy is great but some of the tools that I learned in therapy are things that I just apply to my daily life so it's like you know it's just it's always working it's things that you know I'll be in a situation where used to Corey would freak out but then I remember what my awesome therapist said and I'm like oh right uh, you know, some version of count to 10, but it's a lot more complicated and you need a professional to explain it to you. I promise. Uh, it has changed my life, but seriously, it's like a, a D B C, you know, for, for depression. And listen, uh, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give better help a try. Uh, it's entirely online. Like I said, you ain't got to go nowhere. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. And by the way, if you and your therapist don't jive, I got lucky and me and the first one, it worked out. But if you, if that's not the case, you can get another one and it's no extra cost or anything. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And like I said, switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash POA today and get 10% off your first month. That's better H E L P.com slash POA. Get your brain fixed. <laughs> What's up, Airheads? Welcome back once again to Putting On Airs. Special episode this time. Look here, you might see some unfamiliar faces for the first time in POA history. We have guests. You guys didn't know that, did you? You're the first guest on the show. We've had guest hosts. A uh, couple of those. Uh, Smart Mark filled in for Corey. Corey's sister filled in for me. But you guys are our first guests. Everybody's the host of the Medium Popcorn Podcast. Brandon Collins and Justin Brown. How are y'all doing today? Doing, doing fantastic, right. man. Thank you. Living the dream. Yeah, living. glad to be here. Me and Corey met Brandon uh, doing Doug Loves Movies with him in Washington. Yeah. Well, I should say getting smoked by him on Doug yeah. Loves Movies. <laughs> bad. Uh, real bad in uh, Washington, D.C. Then we, me and him, and me and Corey have done the Medium Popcorn uh, podcast and whatnot. Now you guys are on here. We're glad to have you. We're going to talk about fancy Hollywood stuff and things of that nature. But first, I thought uh, we do it at the end, too, but I figured why not just off top give you guys an opportunity to, you know, plug whatever, tell people how to find your stuff and what you want them to know about. Absolutely. Thank you guys again for having us on. Uh, you can check out the medium uh, popcorn podcast, all podcast platforms. We have an exciting show coming up in New York city on Friday, October 27th at under St. Mark's theater as part of the uh, frigid days of the dead festival. We're going to be reviewing Friday 13th. Jason takes Manhattan. Mm, I've never nice. seen this movie, but I've seen a lot of pictures. I've seen a lot of gifts from it. I know it's going to be crazy. So I'm more of a fan of the Muppet version of that movie, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny about that? And I'm sure you guys don't remember. Why would you remember? But when the three of us were on Doug Loves Movies together at the DC Improv, it was a Halloween episode. Yep. And we had to name Friday the 13th movies. And at one point, we were getting down the bottom of the barrel, and it got to me. And I was like, I was like, Friday the 13th, part eight, Jason takes Manhattan. And everybody was like, what the fuck? You know, because like it was <laughs> like a deep pull and out of nowhere. But, you know, I, I told you at the time, like I grew up in a video. My dad owned the video store in the small town I grew up in. And I grew up in that. And I, that that box art, like that that movie is like 
seared into my brain for some reason. I can see the cover of that VHS very well, but I never actually watched it either. But I remember thinking it, you know, looked wild. I, yeah, I remember the poster too. It was very like visceral, like yeah. the image yeah. of like the mask and the knife and, and the skylight and stuff. But right. uh, yeah, I mean, Trey, I mean, I, when you pull that out, I remember being like, yeah. oh, we might have a game here. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, but we're not. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I thought you guys did pretty good, but like, there'd be times where Trey would pull out some stuff. I'm like, oh, shit. Maybe. I will tell yeah, well, you. I did, a, I did another just, just to put it out there. I've since done Douglas movies a couple other times, and I did a live version in, um, at uh, T- Dynasty Typewriter in LA too, I oh. did a live one out here, and I actually won that one. So I have one victory under my belt. It's nothing compared to your thirty-eight or whatever you've got. But like, <laughs> you know, I was pretty proud of it. I was proud of myself. I did not win in any way, but I was very entertaining, which to me is the point of live yes. comedy. So I feel like I still came out a winner. <laughs> and then I did a version. I did Doug Loves Movies by myself, and once again got the fuck beat out of me. <laughs> so yeah so you're doing this show you're covering uh jason takes manhattan friday october 27th in new yep. york city uh and yeah how can people you know if yeah, in the you new can york area popcorn.com uh in person live stream uh all that stuff um and it's at 10 30 p.m eastern standard time it's gonna be a lot of fun we're giving away presents uh well not presents but prizes yep. for yep. Uh, the yep. people with the best halloween costumes uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just dreading watching this movie because Friday the 13th movies are always so trashy. Like, it's just a dude with a machete who's really strong. It's all right. Nightmare. Killing anybody who ever had premarital sex. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. <laughs> Very biblical. <laughs> so, well, that sounds fun. So, I, we like I told you guys before you came on here, this is a, you know, we t- it's two, us two hillbillies talking about fancy people shit is the conceit of the show. And, you know, Hollywood, especially old Hollywood, is pretty fancy. So I think we could get some pretty on-brand stuff out of this. But I had some questions for you guys uh, before we even get to all that, just some things that interest me. I was kind of wondering if you guys could talk about how you just got into the the film criticism game in the first place. Like, I, I, I find that interesting. So, you know, I've been a movie guy my whole life, grew up in a video store, all that stuff. Like, how did you get into all this? Go ahead, Brandon, you start off. Yeah, man. I uh, I initially started the podcast off just being a guy with a microphone talking about movie news and like movies I had watched. And then uh, I realized that that's incredibly lonely. I'm already an only child. So I was like, this is just dark. Um, and my friend, you know, Justin, who's on the show with me, uh, we have been doing sketch comedy for a long time together. Like we met on a college humor set years and years ago and we just vibed and we could talk about anything and riff on anything. And, and we were talking about movies one day and I was like, hey, man, you want to like co-host this this thing i'm doing with me and then like we we tried out a few episodes and then once we got our theme song which i will debate anybody like i think it's the best podcast theme song of all time we've got a pretty um, good one okay i know you guys have said that before but you know when we have people <laughs> tweeting at us randomly on a sunday just saying i heard uh easy lover oh shit i should have said uh <laughs> yeah. i heard i heard the inspiration for your theme song at the gas station and i sang along with it i'm like all right that's that's pretty cool yeah, we got, um, we got you now. Yeah, and it just became like a whole thing where we talked about specific, like, you know, specific genres. Then we started bouncing around, old and new. And I think things really took off on the film critic side when Ryan Tomatoes reached out and um, gave us accreditation. Because that legitimized yeah. our reviews, which is insane because we had a guy that had to listen to every episode, transcribe right. it. <laughs> and so he would email us back and be like, guys, what the F? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What- yeah. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because that was gonna be my next question. Cause I, you know, we've done your podcast, done Douglas movies with you, whatever, love you guys, all that stuff. But like I use Rotten Tomatoes pretty regularly, like when I'm trying to decide what to watch or whatever. And I was I don't remember what the movie was, but I was on there somewhat recently and was looking at the, you know, the like the actual like professional critic review section. And you guys were on there. Medium popcorn, you're like one of the top sure. reviews for every movie. I was looking at and I was like, what the hell? Cause I just I don't know. I just wasn't expecting that. It's like you said before yeah. we started, like when I popped up on Veronica Mars, you were like, That's weird. Cause they're not up the there as snobs like you assume all the credited rotten tomatoes people would be. Well, I just didn't know so I just didn't know. I mean, how that happened. So they, they found you. They, they let they, black like, people they... on Rotten Tomatoes now. I think it's what Trey's dancing around. <laughs> no, I just didn't, you know, I mean, like, I was wondering if you had to, like, apply or ask or whatever, or they came to you and were like, hey, we think you're great. You guys want to become an official reviewer or, like. Yeah, that was a really unique situation where, like, I think two things happened back to back that yep. 
um, caused Rod Tomatoes to reach out to us. One was that we got a great write up at RogerEber.com. And then two was we had this epic episode uh, reviewing Good Burger. And that took on like a huge, like it kind of like went crazy with like, uh, especially the black podcast community. Yeah. And that those two things kind of like got on the radar around tomatoes. And they're the ones that reached out and said, Hey, we love what you guys are doing and what your, uh, your aim is. So here's accreditation. I think they, I mean, I don't think they look, they pay attention to us enough to want to like have regret, but <laughs> yeah. I think there's definitely a problem with the guy who was assigned to us was like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess God. that's kind of a segue <laughs> into, into getting to talking about, you know, fancy type stuff. I was going to ask you guys also like how, pretentious or hoity-toity or that type of thing the world of film criticism is in your experience because it seems like quite a bit and like Corey said you guys are not like that so what's your been, been your experience with that people they take themselves pretty seriously they like oh, huffing their own farts oh, a lot like it well, we went to a party uh we went to a party a film critics party i think after um a, a screening that we did and we sat down and we were just like well uh this these are not our people no one yeah. <laughs> No, no one spoke to us. Um, it and was, we're not just talking about like, just like there's no like black people there. There were black people there. It was just, they just had a different vibe. It's like the people like, you're, I think you're, uh, yeah. you're thinking of Trey, like yeah, right. really snotty, like, oh, you're like peasants that sit in like the regular seats. Kind right. Of thing. It's just, yeah. yeah, they were very pretentious. Everywhere, everyone's wearing extremely large brim hats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put it. Yeah, we, we, we definitely uh, were made to feel on a number of occasions that we may not belong. How do, do you know how that, how those people get into, like, or do they go like Ivy League programs or something that lead to that? You know what I mean? Like, why are they so, where do they get off being like that? You know what I mean? Like, where do they come from? Like, it's so weird, man. It's like, a, I think it's worse out in New York than it is in LA. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. In New York, there's just like a certain level of like, I get to go to these variety parties and shit, so I'm just going to be snobby to everybody. I don't know how they get these positions. You don't really learn how someone so gets to write for these certain trades yeah. or get the platforms that they have. But in LA, it feels more equal. Like I remember going to a little mermaid screening with like writers for Hollywood Reporter, and then I was sitting next to the guy from Hot Wings, and everyone's just chill. Like mm -hmm. no one's being a dick. But in New York, there will be people that like purposely will sit next to each other and like take over. Like they don't care about talking or anything like that because they're part of this crew that no one can fuck with in the film industry. And here's my problem with them. I have a lot, but here's my problem <laughs> with them. And I want you to talk about your experience in this because me and Trey have long said that certain people like this, they they criticize and rate comedy movies on the same scale that they like they look at joe dirt and they look at it through a citizen kane lens and that's how they judge the movie and we've always felt like and it would be cool if rotten tomatoes would like y'all like y'all's review of a comedy movie should be you should get more points or it should be highlighted to the mm. top by the way these are you know comedians so this is rated as a comedy but how do these like, I'm sure that you've met some of these people who, like, they go into a comedy movie, and no matter what, even if it's the funniest movie ever, they just go, artistically, this is fucking garbage, and therefore, zero percent. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it's, we, I, I see it a lot, I see it a lot, and it's maddening, because they, they express, I can't remember the, the recent movie, but there's, like, some films that we watch, and I'm just like, okay, like, this thing was just awesome, it was so fun and such and then you see the rotten tomatoes the meter is just atrocious and it's like how could someone rate this like this and you know it's just you know but you know i you try to say oh it, it wasn't for them and such but you know sometimes it it could also be us though yeah that's i was gonna say because we have okay so paddington 2 had like a hundred percent of rotten tomatoes As for you yeah, and, uh, you guys ruined one, that <laughs> one, until, I got, until I got a hold of it. It dropped down oh to my God. <laughs> it was a one rating, but then Justin came in and like took it down like two points because of his rating. And that's the day that's that's the time we started getting death threats. Yeah, yeah I was about to, I'm not surprised. I didn't know people, who I was sending those to, but hell yeah, <laughs> right. people worship that movie, dude. And it's like revered for 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 when it was like one of the whatever handful of movies that have 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. And you know, it popped up in uh. The unbearable weight of massive talent that Nicolas Cage and Pedro Pascal movie. It's like a running joke in that movie how incredible Paddington Two is or whatever. So you guys really went against the the grain on that one. 
So yeah. it's funny. That's what convinced me to watch it. So that's what, yeah. like that that bit in the movie. Yeah. And then we watched. I actually really enjoyed it. I actually yeah. thought it was a lot. Of fun. Justin was just like in a bad place. And just well, he just just did on. not like it. First of all, I watched it with my kids. Yeah. And my kids were not in the. Were, they were just like, "What is this?" So there's that. That then affects it, your writing, I say. Yeah. I mean, that's so, fair, I think. Yeah. So then the other part is, is like, you know, obviously, you know, when our review came out, I believe the queen, no, it was shortly after the queen died. So, or, or no, 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 the queen died. You were just like, fuck Britain <laughs> all together. Yeah. 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 Salt in the womb, baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, so actually, the, the main thing that happened here was the fact is when the queen died, uh, uh, a, a video surface, which was not far before her death, of her with Paddington. So then it like circulated Paddington two all over again, which then brought people back to Rotten Tomatoes. So I have just like, just like waves of just death threats. People yeah. reaching out to me on Twitter just to curse <laughs> me out. Which of course I I, I love it. I, it death threats yeah. are not something to laugh at, but these particular death threats yes. I find very amusing. Oh, Coming from fans oh, of Paddington <laughs> Two, like that definitely makes it funnier for sure. Like you yeah, have, but, having no self awareness about like how wild that is to be threatening <laughs> to kill someone because they didn't like your anthropomorphic bear movie. No, you know, not what I mean? because they didn't like it, because they fucking ruined its score in the yeah. wake of their <laughs> queen's death. There's a little bit of context here. Fair I mean, enough. These threats came from Brendan Gleeson. <laughs> like you just, yeah, you right. That's my favorite role ever. You piece of shit. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. Um. Oh, oh, do you guys, what about like when it comes to like, I don't know how to put, not really so bad it's good, I don't know, kind of, just like big dumb movies that you have a good time with, but you you know the whole time you're the like, Meg. this is bad. Like, this is not good, but I like it. Like, I just went and rewatched in my hotel room the other night because it was on Showtime. I rewatched for the first time since I was a kid the movie uh, Congo, right? And like, I was oh, a big, yeah, I, I, was a big I was a big Michael <laughs> Crichton kid because of jurassic park yeah. read all his movies i watched that movie i remember loving it i rewatched it just like a couple of weeks ago and like i still love i thought ernie hudson <laughs> ruled in that movie like i thought he was so great and delroy lindo and all this too but there's like all these like, like laura lenny with a laser at the end of it being like put him on the endangered species list and she just starts <laughs> mowing gorillas down with a space laser or whatever like <laughs> it's not good but it's fun though so like where do you guys stand we, on that dynamic when it comes to movies? Yeah, we love doing that shit, man. I, yeah. I think, like that's a, the, where the most fun episodes come from, like for comedy purposes. But I mean, I will say, Congo, we have yet to do, which is so insane because Tim Curry is out of his goddamn mind. Yeah, yeah dude, he <laughs> but, is. Uh, he we're a wild. Dude, this is how weird I was growing up. I was like into Laura Liddy in yeah. Congo. Like, yeah. I was a weird kid. Yeah, you were. Um, yeah, you were. I'm sure yeah, Laura like, Lenny would love to hear that someone describes <laughs> themselves as weird because they had an attraction to her at one point. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we do it all the time. Like, uh, most recent, really, like, we do a lot of Sly Stallone movies from the 80s. Yeah. And those top crazy. Over the top, amazing. Oh, yeah. dude. That movie, yeah. dude, when he turns his hat around backwards and you're like, buddy, he's about to take out with his motherfucking left hand, son. <laughs> yeah. <right>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and his lip goes crooked. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was a pre-existing condition with Sly, but yeah. <laughs> the stroke. Yeah. Does that affect y'all's, like, how you enjoy the movie is one thing, but, like, if you're going to rate Congo on I'm or on Rotten Tomatoes, do you look at it and go, okay, objectively, movie not good, but also I enjoyed it. So, like, are you going to throw the two thumbs up on it or whatever the we, fuck it is? We go with what our heart says, man. Like, we're not, like, that's what makes us authentic, I think, which is probably what's prevent us from getting to the next level in regards to the prestige of being a film critic. Mm. But we're honest. You know, we say, like, hey, we're comedians. If you can't tell by the opening theme song that we're going to be goofy and not take this shit too seriously, like, that's on you. Um, so for Congo, I probably would give it, like, a, a, a fresh yeah, mm -hmm. but I imagine this would give it a rod. You know what I mean? But like that's just us being well, it, to ourselves. But then again, I love that movie so I, much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it also matters of, you know, how you watch that movie. Like because mm -hmm. there's I think there's so many uh, extenuating circumstances that come into, you know, watching cinema. 
you know, so like, you know, because how you feel and how that movie makes you feel in that yep. moment is definitely going to play a part. So it depends, like, what's going on when I watch Congo? Who Absolutely. Knows? <laughs> so, um, but, I, well, you know, I, I'm not going to say what I would get uh, give it, but I, I will say that every time Dude, Ernie Hudson's Congo, in it, you know, you have to give it a fresh, but I feel to. like you would it. That's and I'm saying. Not only is he in it, that's what that was the main takeaway for me of rewatching it as an adult. The whole time I was just like, dude, Ernie Hudson is absolutely killing this movie. Like he's like <laughs> far and away the standout. He's so charismatic. He's just great in that movie. That actually yeah. led to me starting a rewatch of Oz, Oz. The HBO show where he <laughs> plays the, the warden or whatever, which th those are pretty different. Also, yeah. I've talked about this a lot, but I'll tell you guys just since it came up. What's funny about that is, like, I grew up at my dad's video store. He let me watch R-rated movies from too young of an age. That extended to TV as well. I watched Oz as it aired with my dad when it came out. That show came out in 1997. I was 11 years old when that show started. <laughs> that is fucking hardcore, dude. I've, re I've got an 11-year-old son right now. And I restarted Oz, and not with him, but I've been watching it like, Jesus Christ, Dad, what the hell were you thinking? You know what I mean? Like, it's uh, it's pretty brutal, that show. And, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's cracking me up thinking of 11-year-old me watching it and wondering why I'm, you know, no wonder I'm all fucked up today. But uh, So when HBO, I came out, oh, sorry, just, that was 97, right? So yeah. I think so I was 13, and all I remember is going in uh, to high school and – wearing the little beanie on the top of my head yeah I like was, out of bc the, i was rocking the baldy back then too and yeah. and just being out of bc hey he's yeah. also in congo congo was his yeah. first uh film role i think uh yeah. oh shit I, I can't say his name he's got a long hard to say oh, name triple a. yeah he was on lost right yeah yes he was on lost as mr eco or whatever and he was a uh, killer croc in the shitty suicide yep. squad and mm -hmm. he was at a BC in Oz, but his first film role was actually in Congo. Funnily enough, I didn't even think about that till this moment. Uh, so yeah, like by I the said, way, I tried out that when I did my first watch of Oz, uh, I was like, there, I was like, they have to have had his toboggan glued to his fucking head. Like, there's no yeah. way you can do that. <laughs> and then turns out, because I'm bald, and when I shave it super slick. You you can do it like the, yep. there's there's suction like it actually works. Uh, so I apologize for appropriating from Oz, but like I was also wearing my <laughs> toboggan like that for a minute. Yeah, so, it only works on a bald head. Yeah, that's it. Um, so what do y'all think about uh, you know the the fanciness of Hollywood or whatever over the years? First of all, I feel like. Because maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the only stuff that survived. I feel like when people think about old Hollywood, it's like exclusively fancy, glitch, yeah. glam, golden yeah. era type shit. Whereas I feel like today, I mean, they still got the red carpets and the Oscars and all that type of stuff. But I feel like they also, a lot of the biggest stars, they try to be like an everyman. Th you know what I mean? Like they try to be, they try yeah. to like deny their fanciness. A lot yeah, of whereas do. Clark like, oh, Gable just did like, not do that. They're just like us type of thing. But I don't know. Maybe they tried to do that back then too. I don't know. What do y'all think about that? Yeah, I mean that's why like I like uh, I laugh at like the news stories. I appreciate news stories like when Reese Witherspoon got hammered. Yeah, and like, yeah. she got pulled over. She was like, "Do you know who the fuck I yeah. am?" I was like, "Yeah." yeah. That was a that's Georgia what, girl coming out at her. That shit, <laughs> you don't use that to save the Amazon. Yeah. And save cats. You use it to get out of the parking drive yeah. for driving ticket and shit. That's funny. <laughs> um, I well. You know, much like you said, it's like I think uh, the the glitz and glamour of Hollywood has kind of gone away. Right. Uh, but I, you know, the fanciness is still there. But also, I think that there's a lot of people who are by far nowhere close to fancy who try to depict themselves as fancy, and those are the people that I'm just like, uh, gross. Like who? Please elaborate. Yeah. Oh yeah. uh, <laughs> man. Uh, it, it, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. Oh, shit. Kirsten, uh, Kirsten uh, Stewart, I would say. I feel like uh, she comes off as the emo trash she makes herself out to be, and I'm for it. Yeah, I, I think she. Yeah, I think she's. I, I think in her films, she they they kind of try to fancy her up, but I don't think Ooh. that she's actually fancy oh. in real life. You know. Oh wait. So we're talking about the other way, right? We're talking yeah. about people that are fancy in movies but aren't in real life, or yeah. the other way around. Yeah, the kind of, yeah, exactly. Because I'm thinking like Jennifer Garner, right? She always is really fancy in movies, but in real life, she's like very frumpy. She looks like a librarian. 
I'm not even being. I'm just. I'm just, yeah. I'm just looking at TMZ. I'm not even trying to be. Uh, hey, you know who's a guy who's kind of like that, who is like that, but who really hits for me and Corey because of it. Did you guys know that Lee Pace is like an Oklahoma good old boy dude who like hunts and fishes and wears camo and shit like that? That makes sense. That guy's jacked. <laughs> yeah, but like, but he plays like dude. People like no people like us don't get to play elves like fucking right. big <laughs> royal regal elves like fucking riding a riding a moose and shit like and I mean he's currently know, playing to, the the empire in fucking uh yeah foundation whatever that, foundation yeah like and you know when he was in uh, Guardians of the Galaxies he was a tyrant but he was like a right. royal like almost pharaoh esque type tyrant. Right. You know someone who Honey Dick does really good as an audience that it was a great introduction to him, especially for American audiences? Tom Hardy. Inception, he looked fucking smooth and suave. And yeah. Everything he's done after that, he's been fucking batshit crazy. That's true. Yeah, he's like, wild. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's looked weird. He has looked weird. Um, but then you got your like prototypical fancy. Like we still have some of that, like, you know, like Hugh Grant, he's having a renaissance. Hugh lately, Grant. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, a career renaissance lately, but he was like that dude. But we elevate British, you know what I mean? Yeah, He's always. like British and posh, and in America, it's like there's nothing fancier than that. Like a no. posh British guy to Americans, just like that's peak fanciness as far as American audiences He's are concerned. He's doing this phase though, which is kind of good. Like yeah. I don't know if well, he, that show he did with Nicole Kidman, but he yeah he, he was did. he was a good bad guy in that. Uh, as well as Dungeons and Dragons, he's going yep. through this weird He's like, right. age British. Oh, he was a patented too. He was yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, and you know what, man? Like Hugh Grant, he, so talk about someone who was bef ahead of his time. Like Hugh Grant got absolutely crucified for doing something in the '90s that if he did it now, we would be fucking like, yeah, man, oh. positive sex worker shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like nobody would be mad. They'd be happy that he didn't kill him and throw him in a dumpster. But like he just like that was he was like made out to be the worst human being ever, which I think kind of probably knocked him down on the posh scale. You know? Well, also Eddie Murphy. Yeah, Eddie that's Murphy. true. I mean, he would have been praised. Yeah, he would have been praised if, if he did what he did uh, now. Would have hurt his career. But I, one thing I got to say about like people, like like, there's a thing with with some films where if, like people like they that is perceived fanciness. For me, a, a a part of perceived fancy is like when I see this person on screen, do I kind of want to punch him in the face? <laughs> <laughs> Hugh yeah. Grant's I mean, got that. I mean, like, that makes how, sense. How punchable is the face? And right. Cumberbatch. Yeah. Yes. So it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Miles Teller. Want to punch? Oh, that. yeah. But like, I want to punch yeah. Miles Apparently Teller in real life. Benedict, Cumber Benedict Cumberbatch maybe seems like a, a fine fellow, but dude, at the first time I ever saw him, I was like, and it's not that I want to punch every British person, but like, some people you have to hear them talk to like how many there's been so many actors that we find out are British and we're like, holy shit, my mind's blown. Yeah. Benedict oh, yeah. Cumberbatch is fucking British from like nine miles away, you know? <laughs> <laughs> have you guys been to uh the i'm i mean i know you i'm sure you have like ho the walk of fame and hollywood boulevard and all that shit and like actual hollywood here it's like because again you grew up again growing up loving movies my dad's movie store wanting to move to hollywood thinking hollywood's the pinnacle of glitz and glam or whatever the first time you get there you walk out and it's like oh this is way more heroiny than i thought it was oh, gonna so be yeah like, yeah dude, like, i was in la I, I moved to la for uh to write a universal for a year and that was one of the first places i went to because I had never been downtown LA and uh, oh no, to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I was just like, this is disgusting. Yeah, it like, is. It's gross. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, all people don't realize. Just, like, either that's have dry gum or. <laughs> that's yeah. where you pick up it, <laughs> it's funky. It is funky. What about uh, Babylon? Did y'all see that movie? It's directly related to this conversation. Yeah. 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 I yeah. did not. I did not like it, man. And yeah. I'm a fan of Fame and Chazelle, but I yeah. just couldn't. Too much? Do you think it was too much? Uh, I think it was just way too long. Like way I remember too long. Through, I, I remember halfway through being like, "All right, we got this Javier Bardem like wannabe," and then like I was at Ammo Draft House and I wrote down the little like card. I was like, I, I wanted to write down to the waiter, "How much longer is this?" Because <laughs> yeah, right. this is this is long in the tooth. And if it was only like an hour or something in. I'm like, if Margot Robbie's on on screen, like yeah. I am not into yeah. this at all. I I turned it up so. It's about like the golden age of Hollywood, like at right the tra transition from silent film to talkies, that and about all the the glitz and glam and the excess and all this. And so the movie is a font of excess, and it's like 
and indulge. It's very self indulgent. It's very ambitious, and 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 it's you know it's really it's it's a lot. It's a spectacle for sure. Mm. And I kind of respect it for that, but I don't know. I'm like, I'm not going to watch it again anytime soon. And I started watching it on the road after a comedy show, like in my hotel room. And I was like, oh, I need to go to bed. I'll finish this tomorrow. And I felt like I'd watched a whole movie and I paused it and had like an hour and a half left or something. I was like, Jesus Christ. But I did finish it. But yeah, but you know, (laughs) they do a good job of showing like, or I don't know. Those movies are weird. Those are kind of like Scorsese's movies sometimes with like the Wolf of Wall Street or gangster shit where it's like, they're showing this like, see, ultimately it's gross and it's bad and it's not worth This is the cost of this type of lifestyle type of thing, but it still makes it look pretty fun and rad most yeah. of the time. You <laughs> know what I mean? It's like, it's a weird like glorification condemnation, like dynamic that they can't, then they're trying to like walk that tightrope and I don't know if they really pull it off, but. So I, I think that's why, like, um, especially if you're in the uh, business, like a film like like Tropic Thunder. Oh, that God. Film so yeah. good. Because fresh, right? Really super fresh. fresh. Oh, super. Because it was just telling you, it was just like, hey, you know all that stuff about Hollywood that you think is like, it's all bullshit. Right. It's all bullshit. And there's so many bullshit people out there. And it's not what you think. And it's closer to this that, than anyone really wants to admit. It's just like, or if you thought it was like this, yeah, you're kind of right. That's why I love that movie so much because it really I, turned Hollywood on his head. I think oh, yeah. if we're being, if everyone on earth is being honest with themselves, you could say, someone could say Tropic Thunder is the greatest movie of all time. And I don't, I'm not saying that's correct, but I'm saying that person should not be laughed out of the room. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, it definitely has one of the funniest performances of all time. Like, Justin and I, like, we will never like not praise Robert Downey Jr. For that. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. like that's for the thing sure. that's interesting about this cancel culture thing that happens sometimes is that occasionally like young people will discover Tropic Thunder and try to cancel Robert Downey Jr. And then black people will be like, no, we think no. that shit's bad funny. No, yeah. right. He's so crazy. At Absolutely it. not. We're here for it and we yeah. want more of it. Give that guy his own movie. When you crush, re- that's the thing that people don't understand is like, first off, I have my own thoughts on how cancel culture is not really even anything it's just like oh some people get mad at a thing and then everyone gets mad that someone was mad but ultimately nothing ever happened like yeah. louis still selling out madison square garden who gives a fuck shut up what you want yeah. is a world without any consequences and that does not exist but the thing about it is is when you when someone crushes so hard all the offense drips away because it's like it eh, you can't it's so fu- like like i know that white people are not supposed to do impressions of black people but every now and then you see a white dude who does a charles barkley so good that you're like but it's identical you know what i mean you can't and, if you crush you no one can be mad and charles barkley loves that guy like that right. guy Char- charles barkley like brings that guy on inside the nba to do an impression of him in front of him because he's like this guy fucking rules because you know because he nails it he's a nails white it. dude but he sounds exactly like him and if Barkley's but, signing off on it, then everybody else needs to shut the fuck up, you know. But the, I think what we're missing, though, when we talk about Robert Downey Jr.'s performance, though, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because Justin and I could talk conservatively all two hours about this performance. But you can see in his eyes that he is playing an Australian dude yeah. playing the Osiris guy. Yeah. But maybe he's a soldier in this situation. Like, you see the badness that's going on in his brain, and you just can't. You're just like, this is insane. Like, this is one of the best mind yeah. fucks ever. It's what people it, it, every now and then some like Ben Stiller will quote a tweet or something saying like something bad about Tropic Thunder and him being like, oh, you know, no, I, I stand by it or whatever. People act like every now and then somebody acts like, oh, you couldn't make that movie today. I don't know that that's true. It's, I think it's that not be, true because of what that movie is and does and, and what it really is about. Like, I think you can make that movie. In you know why you couldn't make it today? It still smash. Cause they already fucking made it. There'd be no right. reason. Yeah. Like I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I'm saying you could. Yeah. South Park right. is still doing right. it. Guys. South Park is doing the it's same still shit. Still yeah. fucking doing it. Exactly. That's true, man. Well, I rewatched that movie like a few months ago. Me too. I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> the stuff they were saying in that movie. <laughs> yeah, but it's hilarious, though. especially something like the stuff that could be perceived as like anti-Semitism, which what isn't the case because of right. the creators themselves. But you're just like, holy shit, man. <laughs> yeah uh well i guess sort of in that vein i also want to ask you guys we talk about like the golden era of hollywood and all that them old ass movies the classics and stuff i just i have to ask like you know 
where are you guys at on that whole era, considering how profoundly racist Hollywood and the country and everything was at the time <laughs> those movies were being made? You know what I mean? Like, it was uh, not not good. <laughs> you guys so, didn't hear me, did you? No, no I was you, hoping you'd still. I, I know what you said. You said how profoundly racist and uh, exclusionary to black people it was, and the fact that nobody was represented, and the fact that Hattie McDaniel couldn't even attend the uh, movie that she won the that. Oscar for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the fact that, like, most black people that were on screen weren't actually black people. It was people uh, in blackface. Right. You know, or, 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 or dressed as Asian people, playing Asian people, yeah. and things like that. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's weird because I think you have to look at those films for what they are. And, like, yeah, the time frame is the time frame. It's a period piece. And, like, you know, it is what it is. So, like, <laughs> You know, I kind of, it's just its own uh, separate thing. Uh, right. We don't really touch on that stuff on the show. Like, because one, it's usually it's not that much fun watching them. Of course. Like, even even the real big, like, considered classics, like Gone with the Wind and stuff, I would just kind of be, like, shrugging my shoulders. Because I don't think, there's so many things we have to address when you cover films like that, that it's hard for you as a comedian to, like, try. It's exhausting just to try to find the funny. Sure. When you have to bring up so many facts about the laziness behind the creators and how racist they were. And, you know, it's, it's a lot. Um, I mean, I would love to do more movies like Citizen K and stuff like that, that I genuinely think are like phenomenal movies and stuff, but we usually tap out around the seventies. That's yeah. about the oldest yeah. we'll go just because it's, it, it's, it doesn't get, it's not much fun to right. review the movies. Sure. Beyond yeah. then, you know, like just for a com comedy purposes in our audience, meeting them where they're at, they just would not be into us reviewing movies from like the forties and shit. Right. Like, they yeah. don't care about our takes on Charlie Chapman movies. Well, you know? right. it, it kind of just hits a little different when, when people say, you know, the Negroes and you're just like, yeah. Oh no, they meant mm. that in a completely different way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not for like, you know, kind of historical, you know, being trying to be historically accurate and like no this is just they really meant that so it's like it's hard to kind of separate you know some of the the racism and stuff like that in there and not feel some sort of way about it but you also kind of have to carpet uh, uh why can't i say the word uh compartmentalize yeah there you go uh you know everything going on and just like try to view it without it but you know how can you don't worry, I got you, baby. Thank you. I know what you're saying. <laughs> you know, y'all in luck for the war broke out. I was a sorcerer down in San Diego. You really can quote that shit all the time. <laughs> you been talking to me this whole time? <laughs> you more shredded than Julianne said. All right. Sorry, guys. All right. No, oh, you can uh, do that. You can do that forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you guys think about, like, uh, like the... Yeah, should I wait? I thought you were telling me to wait. You're not telling me to wait, are you? You can't hear me. Sorry. I was telling them to wait because you would eventually get there. I know, but I yeah, I didn't know that. Anyway, I, I would uh, forgot what I was going to say. So <laughs> falling apart over here, Corey. You do something. I keep freezing up. I'm getting mad about it. So <laughs> okay. you take over. All right, guys. Well, one more time because uh, this has been fun. One more time. Where? Is it you're going to be in New York? What is it you're doing? And plug that podcast once again for everybody just tuning in. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much again for having us on. We have to have you both on probably to do Congo uh, for all the right. Medium Pop oh. podcast, which is available on all podcast applications. Um, we're doing a live show on Friday, October 27th. as part of the Frigid Days of the Dead Festival. We're going to be reviewing Friday the 13th. Jason Takes Manhattan. We'll have tickets for in-person and live stream if you're not in the New York area. And that's at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, on Friday, October 27th, you can get tickets at mediumpopcorn.com. That's wonderful. When I say, I want to ask you this one question before we, before we leave you. And I don't know if you've prepped it or on the spot. When, when, I, when, when, when I say that's a fancy movie, what's the first movie that comes to your mind that just screams, that is fancy? Twilight. I think any, I think anything with fucking vampires is fancy because they immediately go fucking they immediately just go like Victorian age. Jedi. That's true. Maybe it's not like Twilight. It's just vampire shit. Vampire, vampire shit, shit just goes fancy to me. Yeah, and they live in big ass castles. So this is like, what's fancier than a fucking castle? That's true. Dracula, blood sucking and uh, holding people captive aside, quite the posh fellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I think of like I Titanic. Like, that's where I go. That's what I was going to say. The first thing that pops into my head when you say fancy movie, the, like doing the exercise sincerely, the first thing that popped into my head was Titanic. Was that yours, Brandon? Yeah, I was going to say Titanic or um, Gosper Park. I love Gosper Park. That's my man, Julian Fellows, B. I fucking <laughs> love that shit. I don't, now, listen, you will also feel very <laughs> underrepresented, but if you ever get a chance to watch Downton Abbey, I highly suggest it. It's wonderful stuff. I've heard good things. I just, uh, I don't, yeah, I just, I, I sometimes don't have the bandwidth for slow BBC. I like BBC that gets stuff going, like mm-hmm. Sherlock and, uh, and Luther. Yeah. Oh, I, love Luther. Abby, I watched, the, I, I, just, I watched the pilot. And I was like, all right, all right. I just want to point out that Brandon said that he doesn't like slow BBC. Hard and fast. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Just making sure everybody heard that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, That's Brandon wonderful. Collins, Justin Brown, Medium Popcorn. Thank you guys. It's good to see you again. Yeah. We'll thanks you for being time, the uh, the first guest we've ever had on this show. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, guys. And, we appreciate it. And just just so you know, I know we talked about Congo, but we, but the last when you were on our episode last time, we also talked about doing Forrest Gump. And okay. I'm still up for Forrest I'm up Gump. for that too. Of any time, buddy. I'm we can do two episodes. Talk about Forrest Gump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, guys, cold turkey may be great on sandwiches, but there's a better way to break your bad habits. We're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor tracking when Mercury's in retrograde or whatever the moon's up to or lighting your candles or putting your crystals out or any of that type of stuff. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong, so instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit fume is an innovative award nominated device that does just that instead of electronics fume is completely natural instead of vapor fume uses flavored air and instead of harmful chemicals fume uses all natural delicious flavors you get it instead of bad fume is good it's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting giving your fingers a lot to do which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking said habits. Joe, tell them your experience with it. Well, I concur. Fume, good. Fume allows me to live my life in a way that I describe as oxygen plus, right? We all have oxygen. Everybody's got the same oxygen, but I like a little, I like my life to be heightened. And with fume, I get oxygen plus. It's oxygen that tastes good, right? It's sweet. You just, you put it to your lips. It's a nice little weighted thingy that makes my oxygen hit harder. It's a portable oxygen hitter harder thing it's beautiful feels great and it tastes like fresh like i got one that's orange and it's like orange breath who don't love orange breath stopping is something we all put off because it's hard but switching to fume is easy enjoyable and even fun fume has served over a hundred thousand customers and has thousands of success stories and there's no reason that can't be you join fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today head to try fume Dot com and use code POA to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's try fum.com and use code POA to save an additional 10% off your order today. Try fume.com slash POA code POA fume good fume good. Those guys are a good time. Always fun. Love people that love movies. Um, I always like. I used to always think I was a big movie buff. You know, I think for a long time I was more than I am now. Like you still are con- to most people. To most people, but he, but I'm saying anytime I meet like a real movie buff, I'm like, oh yeah. man, I, I don't know shit. But like I kind of I kind of fell out of movies quite a while ago, and I really only watch like 
pretty big movies now. I used to try to watch like anything of any yeah. note whatsoever. Was, I've been I've been a Netflix be Oscars. I've been a Netflix subscriber since I was in high school. Like I, I was a Netflix subscriber for ten years before they even started doing streaming shit, like getting the DVDs in the mail. And I did that because I wanted to be able to get to watch anything I wanted, like tiny little indie movies and shit and stuff like that. But ever since TV started hitting so hard, uh, I kind of fell out of of all that. Uh, TV started hitting so hard, I got a career, I got a family. I don't have time to watch that many movies and shit and that type of thing. So now, mostly, I just watch like prominent movies. I used to know a lot more about it than I do. Um, I'm with you. I I changed my movie habits, whereas like I went through a phase that I think everybody goes through. You know, I didn't go to college, but the college years were like, it, you know, you go through this phase of like you only listen to like indie bands. You hate yeah. like you, it's like it's you go through this like fuck Dave Matthews and anything corporate. You do the same thing with beer. You're like, no, man, only an indie brewery, only a beer that nobody knows about. And I did this like with movies, too, like. I would totally reject movies that deep down I knew I would fucking love because I was embarrassed to be, say like that I liked it or something. And I only went for like movies that I know my friends wouldn't even know because for some reason that's a fucking personality. And now, yeah. and now don't get me wrong, like I still try to watch some Oscar Beatty type stuff, but I'm very quick to go, you know what, fuck this, not for me. Whereas used to, I swear to you, I would force, I would like, convince myself that i liked it even if i didn't just because i i like you have to but now i'm like bruh put on jurassic park for the ninth time i'm just trying to hang out with my kid fuck all this let's make everything fun yeah so, so that's what they do over there at medium popcorn too but I, i've had this thing in the on the back burner for a while now and i feel like it's uh a good episode for it because those guys, they're, uh, you know, they're film critics. They do reviews of movies and they talked explicitly about not wanting to be pretentious in their mm -hmm. reviews. You know, they try to be regular people. They don't like the whole pretentious snobbery thing. So in light of that, I wanted to read you some of these pretentious reviews I found, but not of movies. These are Yelp reviews. These are like okay. pretentious Yelp reviews. All right. And and a lot of these, to me, the punchline comes when you find out what they're reviewing. Yeah, yeah okay. so you're saving it. So, all right. Here's one for you. France glamours with the Palace of Versailles. London shines with Buckingham Palace. Not to be outdone, Daly City created its very own Koi Palace. Koi Palace is a Chinese restaurant in Daly City, California, that these people are comparing to Buckingham <laughs> Palace and the Palace of Versailles, evidently. Now, the thing is, without the rest of that review, it could be that could be tongue in cheek, potentially. But, uh, you know, I'm inclined to think otherwise. I thought you were uh, I thought they were about to trash them. Uh, no. but I'm, but I'm super excited that, Hey, you know what, man, I like passion. You know, if you're into this fucking Chinese restaurant, give them their flowers while they're still here. I don't know how to do this one is super long, but there's some good shit in it. So I'm just going to try to, I'll skip around a little bit. So the name of the place is wisdom. It's a bar in Washington, DC. So lounging in wisdom for a relaxed birthday celebration, gently cloaked in the sultry lighting sourced from the jewel toned glass holders that dangle from the eclectic chandeliers. We contemplated the couples nestled in the intimate seating coves along the textured walls, luxurious curtains partially obscuring their gestures of longing, and succumbed to the seductive cocktails crafted from legally potent absinthe, caramel vodka, smoked black tea, elderflower cordial, heady port, and candied ginger. We lingered for much of the evening, our appetites calmed by small plates of creamy crab gratin, earthy Ooh. mushroom duck sails, and Ooh. unctuous hummus. Our spirits soothed by the lilting sounds of jazz and house music remastered with hypnotic background beats. For those who prefer their expressions of hedonism in a setting both subtle <laughs> and seductive, wisdom is exquisite, right? And it's like, Okay, do they have chicken fingers? What's the happy hour? You know, first like, off, I, I want like, this crab gratin. I do I'd tell like you, that does not like it. Yeah. And I would like to, before I forget and we go on, I'm very confused on what the point of, like, I, when I heard, when I hear people say, like, legal absinthe, I think of the same thing as I think of with, like, old Smoky Moonshine Distillery. I'm like, the whole point of absinthe was it was supposed to be this thing that makes you trip. 
And if yeah. you take all of that away, it's just kind of like worse gin. Like, what's the have you ever have you ever had it? You ever drank absinthe? I I know that I have, but I was it was one of those situations where I was real Buddy. fucked up, and someone was like, "You want some absinthe?" So I don't remember it. No good. God awful. Like, uh, so I, I remember it became legal in this country when I was like college aged, and me and my buddies had heard all the stuff about absinthe you know the green fairy or whatever they used to call it because it was yeah. made with wormwood extract right and it that shit made you yeah kind of trip out and so we had heard that and it's like oh absinthe's legal now and i think we missed the memo that like it's a bullshit version right. of it you know i don't think we knew that so we went and found a bottle of absinthe and looked up how to do it the right way you pour and again smoke it you pour it over a slotted spoon with a cube of sugar in it yeah. into like a glass, whatever. It's like a relatively complicated process. And we did all that and then sipped it. We're like, Oh my God. I, I, it's like, uh, it's kind of licorice y sort so of. Like, and I hate, yeah, I hate licorice. I was going to um, say, I remember thinking this is NyQuil, which like that. Yeah. It's not good at all. Yeah. And it's like you said, if it did fuck you up in a trippy way, it, like then that might that might be fine, you know, because right. shrooms taste like shit, you know. I love them, but yeah. But it's just, you love them. You yeah, love I the taste you. of shrooms? Yeah, we've talked about How? this. How? Because You're I like full people of do. shit. No, I'm not. No, no you I'm not. don't. Yes, no, I do. No, you don't. Yes, You're I do, because I thing. like roots. Because I, no, I'm not doing a thing. I swear to You're God, people find it weird. Now, I also like them with peanut butter. Because they're horrifically bad. That's why no, people find it weird. No, yes, they I, are. I like beets, though. Like, I like dirt tasting shit. I like root vegetables. I Dude, would I want, would I just eat them if they didn't make me trip? No, I just don't find them. At, like, I remember everybody was like, the first time I took shrooms, everybody was like, dude, you're about to fucking hate it. And I'd heard that my whole life. So I think I went into it thinking, like, this is literally going to taste like eating shit. And when it didn't, I was like, oh, is this all this is? And, like... Yeah, they're fine. Like they're they just take fine. so long to chew up is my thing. That if they, does if suck. they dissolved quickly, the fir the initial taste of them would not bother me that bad. I but you have to them. you have to chew them for fucking forever. Yeah, and it gets old quick. Where, it's like where is chewing like, moldy cardboard or something. It, it see, don't hit. I know it don't hit, but like, see, I don't understand. But I eat literal you. dirt, and you won't. Exactly. That's what I'm going to say. Like, here's here's how you know I'm coming to you from an honest yeah. place. Like, like I can't. Yeah. There's like kratom. There, I can't. I've been taking kratom for fucking years. I still can't in any way just take it straight powder like you do. But I yeah. could eat a garbage bag full of mushrooms in front of you, and you'd be like, Ugh. and to me, kratom is in, I it, dude, uncomparably worse than fucking mushrooms. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, that is a fair point, I guess. It's like, yeah. it's uh, because I'm sure pe people are easily just as grossed out by the taste of Kratom as they are mushrooms. And it's way that worse. Shit it's way don't more bother bitter. me at all. Uh, all right. Here's the next one for you. This one, this one, this one hits for me. Uh, redolent memories of the Ardan countryside drift lasciviously through my mind as I quaff an impeccable Fantome Saison purchased. <laughs> From John's Grocery. This is a review of John's Grocery in Iowa City, Iowa. <laughs> a grocery store in Iowa, bro. Redolent memories of the Ardan. Like Leviciously means lavish, like la right? lasciviously. I lasciviously. think it means like uh like in a sultry fashion. Like uh okay. there was a couple like, words in there I didn't know they knew in fucking Iowa City. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, so so feeling or revealing an overt and often offensive sexual yeah. desire. <laughs> so yeah, lust lustful that type, lewd. And this was just about the grocery store in general, not like any type of food there. I, well, I guess it's a well, grocery store. You know, some grocery stores nowadays, they got like a little bar in it where you can get a beer yeah. and sit there, whatever. I don't really, that, I don't know. It's a real white people. Do you do that? I don't understand people that do that. Um, No, I don't. Well, I, I could kind of see you doing it though. You could because that, but it would only be because Amber went there and I was like killing the time. I think that's what it is. Is like the, ah, you might, the right. Hofa, you might be right, but you might be right. Grocery shopping in our family. So like I'm in and out, you know what I mean? But I, but in a, you know, I've done that. The only time I've ever went to one, it was the Whole Foods in Burbank. And it was because I was uh, dog sitting for Earl and I had to get some stuff and the game was on and I went into the Whole Foods and I was like, holy shit, there's a bar. I'm going to drink here. But like, no, I'm not now. But, but getting, like I said, there's never going to be a situation where Amber's doing the shopping and I'm just killing time. I'm very integral, as I know you are. 
food, yeah. food shopping. And process. I don't waste no time either. I get Me in there and get my shit and, and get out. And that's how I think about it. But you're right. When you think about like husbands being drugged to the store with their wives or whatever, and then I guess I could see them going to that bar and doing yeah, the thing. Because I've always looked at that bar and I've been like, who is taking them up on that? But I <laughs> yeah. guess like, okay. Yeah, the husbands. Uh, all right. Here's another one for you. Um, when I'm sitting and eating my bread in Proustian splendor, I sometimes gaze out the terrace toward the horizon in disbelief, realizing how far I have come from paying $4 for a mealy and tasteless mass-produced brick of preservatives and refined sugars. That is a review of Bezian's Bakery here in Los <laughs> Angeles, California. So they're talking about like some bread they bought from a bakery. <laughs> Who is doing this? Eating my bread in Proustian splendor, gazing across at out the terrace toward the horizon in disbelief. Like, imagine riding a fuck or ri eat eat buying a loaf of bread, eating yeah. it, and then right being inspired to write that. Who do you picture when you're reading this? Because they want to seem like a like hoity toity, like fancy member of society, but I picture someone who is like one of those dudes that wears the fedora that's like, good day, ma'am, you know, my lady. Like, I see that guy who, like, doesn't have anybody else to talk to and is like, let me stretch these linguistic muscles yeah. on fucking Like a yell. neck beard and a fedora? Yes. Yeah, that, right. Guys. Yeah, I'm sure they are mostly like that. You're right. They want you to picture a dude in, like, a, a monocle or something. Yeah, right. You know? But, yeah, it probably is. You're probably right. It probably is that. So uh, this is the last one, but it's, it's... It's the dudes that were beaten off to us in the AOL chat rooms is who it is. This is who they grew yeah. up to be. Yeah. Well, bro, they were grown up then. Those yeah. dudes are papaws <laughs> now. Yeah. <laughs> They're jacking is, off to our kids now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, this is the next generation <laughs> of those guys. Uh, Anyway, this is the last one, but it's, it, it is funny to me when you, like, dissect what they're saying in such a pretentious fashion. <laughs> so this is a review of a bar in Chicago named Wigman's, all right? And this, this is the review. Great is the place that overcomes a heinous cloud of the strongest stench to win my heart. Like the musk of the kraken in full rut. <laughs> We tangled with this odious funk on Saturday night while sipping fine cocktails in celebration of my girlfriend's birthday. So it's like, this place fucking stank. God damn. It's for me. You smell that stank in here? Jesus Christ. Smells like an octopus demon's pussy. You know? <laughs> That's what, that's what they're saying, but all pretentious. But then also being like, it does hit though. This is a good, right. <laughs> this is a good apple teeny. I will give them that. <laughs> I never thought about it, but the Kraken would stink. You know, it would stink, but especially if it was in fucking full rut, a Kraken with a hard. <laughs> this smells like a Kraken butt all. A fresh fucked cracking butthole. That's what this oh place smells God. like, dude. Great, great the musk, <laughs> the oh. musk of the cracking in full rut. That's God, dude. I want to <laughs> hang out with that motherfucker. Yeah. Oh. Oh, so that's that's the last one. That's okay. But yeah, I mean, I'm you know Justin and Brandon. They ain't doing that. I don't. They aren't. They aren't do some of that, but like as a bit, you know what I mean? I agree. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. All right. We got some great airmail. Remember you can email us at putting on airs at gmail.com subject line. Corey, read these limericks on the podcast. You Southern piece of shit. Nice. Um, nice. Hi fellas. First of all, I'm sorry for the subject line, Corey, but I had to get your attention. Now that I have it, here are two limericks for y'all. There once were two jesters who were named Trey and Corey. Uh, and they lured in the peasants with their talent for story. They regaled us with history. They messed up a few, but when all else failed, they all said skew. Uh, it's Corey and Trey are as close as can be. They make me laugh so hard that I want to pee. They're super good friends. Just laughter. No quarrels. That is unless they are talking about squirrels. Hope you yeah. enjoyed those. And now I have you here. I have a suggestion, a suggestion rather, for the trashy fancy Venn diagram. Feeling invincible. 
For the trash, you have getting drunk on natty ice and riding dirt bikes over fireworks in the woods, while the rich and powerful have, I don't know, paying a quarter of a million dollars to venture to the depths of the ocean in a tin can just to be near an old shipwreck for a little while. Just a suggestion for y'all. Stay fancy. Dominic, a spaghetti person from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, they're self-identifying as spaghetti people now. It does hit. I th- feel like... I think we did, I did one on showing off, I think, or something like that, which was like kind of similar, but I do like that though. Not a bad, not a bad one to revisit. That's for sure. Um, Subject line, spontaneous pirate yarring. You can say my name. It's Brian Crawford. Trey told a story of spontaneous pirate yarring on one of your podcasts, which reminded me of a similar occurrence I experienced. For me, it happened 20 years ago at a local music show in Dayton, Ohio. A band I was acquainted with was performing in front of a larger-than-usual crowd, most of whom were unfamiliar with their music, so there was some applause, but it was not so loud that when someone in the crowd loudly yard, everyone heard it, including the lead singer, who responded, Did someone just yar like a pirate? The guy in the crowd enthusiastically repeated his, I presume, drunken yar. The lead, the singer said, that's awesome, and they launched into their next song. Afterwards, quite a few more people in the crowd yard. The singer said, I didn't know Dayton had so many fucking pirates, to which the crowd responded enthusiastically. He then improvised some pirate lyrics about drinking rum, and the band joined in, jamming an impromptu sea shanty s tune. This is another reason why it hits harder to be in a band than a comedian when shit like this happens. Um, it yeah, was I was about to say, form. like, that sounds like that, that, that sounds like that hits, you know what I mean? I imagine yes, that hits right. everybody involved. It was, it was real weird. It didn't hit like for Michael being on stage, you know, people replaced all their laughter with yars and it was right. like, it was just weird. This sounds fun. That does sound fun. Uh, but yeah, apparently he would also know, like, I just, I'm just curious as to how widespread this phenomenon is. Well, so far we only know of you and Trey that this has happened to, but please putting on airs at gmail.com. If you have, uh, run into some spontaneous yarring in the wilderness, please let us know. Uh, subject line enticing limerick. Well, call, color me enticed. Hey there, POA. My name is Joy Watson, and yes, please do use my name on air. I have an idea for your show, which the Venn diagram applies to this one person I have in mind. I heard you like limericks, so I made one to entice you to pick this person. This is my first limerick, so I don't know if it's any good, but I just had to try to get your attention somehow, so I made one. I hope you like it. There was a man from San Francisco City who had great wealth, then became such a pity. He lost all of it, so it did not hit. He got fed up, then thought himself witty. To the U.S. of A., I do decree. I'm the USA emperor, you see. San Franciscans agreed. He's emperor indeed. The United States emperor was he. Emperor Norton was his name. San Francisco gave him his fame. SF respected him, but police thought him dim. They arrested his highness, which was lame. The newspapers wrote of the travesty, of disrespect brought upon his majesty. Demanded him released, his imprisonment ceased, the emperor was given amnesty. He was given clothes worthy of high class. The people saluted Norton in mass. He had his own dollar. He, <laughs> he was thought a baller. The people gladly paid tax without sass. The people looked upon him with much glee. The emperor gave many a decree. Most of them did not do. Some of them did come true. The future Norton could not foresee. He's born Joshua Abraham Norton. He was Emperor Norton and loved a ton. Had his own currency, secured his legacy. For the people, he was a source of fun. Norton, I emperor of the U.S. This is the longest fucking limerick ever. This is an epic limerick. Like, you know, they had epic poems. Like, Beowulf was an epic poem. It's like a poem the size of a book. Yeah, I mean. This is a limerick the size of a book. This this took took a lot of effort. Emperor of the U.S. led a lavish life full of excess until something happened. uh, His life, it would upend. At rock bottom, he did find some success. From riches to rags to royalty, people dared not show him disloyalty. Emperor of USA, what a strange thing to say. The emperor, we show much loyalty. Now she's just explaining. Emperor Norton has all, I don't know who the fuck this is. Do you? I looked it up during, you know, about five minutes ago when you were three, you know, two, one third of the way through that limerick. I, uh, uh-huh. I looked up Emperor Norton, so I'm seeing it right now, but I'm not going to just start reading it. We may talk about yeah, him for in, sure. in detail on a future yeah, thing. He sounds so like a wild some bitch. For sure. I really appreciate that. Uh, subject line limerick. 
<laughs> hey guys, I recently discovered your podcast on YouTube and am loving <sighs> it. I'd like to try out a limerick on you. Trey seems quite self-assured, while Corey's a bit insecure. They're both from the South. When one opens his mouth, what mostly comes out is manure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... <sighs> Show me the oh lie. Oh, my God. Uh, they also say, hope you like it. Since I'm a new airhead, I'm trying to catch up on the lingo. Could you define the word skew for me? Your friend from Washington via Texas and Oklahoma, Stephen Ray Leslie. Uh, Trey... Would you like to explain to our friend Stephen Ray Leslie what skew means? It's just like a hillbilly exclamation or, you know, just a, it's just a thing that, um, it's like our an exclamation people do point, yeah. an exclamation. Yeah. Skew. It's just like, we just do that. Word. We just holler. We holler. Yeah. I mean, really like it's this also is, like Marco Polo sometimes. Yeah. Right. Skew, skew, and it helps you find each other. Uh, We've but done it's that like, at the uh, it's like, uh, you know, sometimes I've wondered, and this is not, you know, this makes it sound like we ought not be doing it, but I have wondered before, cause it's like, we didn't make it up. People do do it. People in my home, old boys everywhere just holler like that. Yeah. Right. And the specific version we adapt, me and my friends always said skew specifically. Right. But you know, just woo hoo, whatever, just hollering. Uh, I've wondered before if that's like the remnants yell. of the rebel yell. It's exactly yeah, what I was going to say. It's exactly what back. I was going to say. Right. I, I, I like, I mean, seriously, I don't think that's that weird of a theory. You know what I mean? Like, I think no, it's I possible. Agree. Like, it, hey, it just hung around. That's the vestiges of it. Like, that's all that's left. I don't know. Oh, by the way, I'm glad that you brought that up because, uh, related to this show, before I get to the last airmail here, related to this show, me and Kirby, uh, Kirby had such great responses from everybody when she guest hosted for you. And there was a lot of people, not only in the comments, but like in on our Reddit too, uh, uh, are putting on airs that were talking about how they missed Kirby from Little House of the Dragon and that they thought me and Kirby should uh do a full game of thrones rewatch podcast and this got me excited i was like oh i would like to do that and of course that's something we could do under the putting on airs umbrella it makes sense to the show and kirby pitched me this name for it and at, when i first heard it i was like that's fucking great because the contention is we're rednecks rewatching game of thrones but then as soon as i thought about it more i was like that could be interpreted differently kirby said the show should be called the south remembers <laughs> Oh well, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I do get it, but yeah. that show's been off the air for like six years or something yeah. now, and like, yeah. I don't think that's what anyone is going to think when they hear that name. <laughs> they're going to think something pretty different. You're yeah. going to attract a pretty, pretty different uh, audience, a demographic, and then they're going to be I disappointed. When they show up. I was it's like, like I ain't nothing I like, about we... Jews in here. What's going on? <laughs> okay, I'm glad that I got your feedback on that. Last airmail here. Subject line, and you know that I was going to click this, transatlantic fellatio rumor. Hey, fellas, pleasure writing to you. Yep, indeed, the rumor that Marilyn Manson took out a rib in order to suck his own dick somehow reached Europe, or Bulgaria at least. I was in ninth grade in 2005 when that tall tale was common knowledge throughout all high school metalheads. Don't know how it came, how it stayed, and how it left. Anyways, stay fancy, motherfuckers. Fancy. Nick. We got a, Bul a Bulgarian listening? That hits. Yeah, and one that's quite a that's a decent amount younger than us, you know. No, <laughs> no. They were they were in ninth grade in two thousand five. I was when you graduated. Oh, two thousand five. I, I that's like that's way after when I heard that. Maybe it got there late. They were a little bit yeah. behind us or something. Because I because I heard the Marilyn Man. I, I didn't even hear the two thousand five part. Yeah. I was in middle school when all the Marilyn Manson rumor thing Me was too. going around which was like that was like the mid to late 90s right well it would make sense that we started it and it got over there yeah yeah like, you know years Albania later just now figured out about michael jackson like 10 years ago you know yeah 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 that's probably what it was yeah okay so, yeah. that makes sense please by the way uh if you are if you are listening to us from a different country such as bulgaria please write in uh to putting on airs at gmail.com we'd love to hear from you and also we would really love to hear if you ever heard that either Marilyn Manson took out a rib to suck his own dick or that Paul from Wonder Years was Marilyn Manson. Uh, I'm interested in that shit. But, hey, it's been fun. By the way, Trey, I don't know if you know this, but our new book, Round Here and Over Yonder, it's out now. It's getting rave reviews. We I were, did hear that. We, yeah, we were number one in England travel, baby. We made it. 
also number one in writing, uh, travel writing and commentary. We hit number one in a bunch of things, and that's all because all of y'all pre-ordered it or bought it. But if you haven't, you can do that at the link in the description to this, or you can go to TreyCrowder.com where you can find tickets to see Trey on the road. Where are you about to be, buddy? Uh, I got a private event this weekend, but next week, Wednesday through Saturday, I'm in Spokane and then Tacoma, Washington. Then I got the Carolinas and Charleston and North and Durham and then Boston and then, uh, San Francisco and Chicago and Phoenix, all that coming up later. So try Crowder.com come and see me. Do that, buy our book, and go to parttimefunnyman.com to get bonus stuff from me. New cooking video went up today, and also we are smack dab in the middle of Colonel Cornbread in the case of the Confederate Ruby, an audio dramedy that I'm uh, writing, producing, acting in, all that stuff. But hey, more importantly, everybody out there, please stay fancy, motherfuckers. Ski away. Here's Lady of Love. One, two, mm-hmm. three, four, one, two, three, four. Royalty and rednecks are alike. They both like cutting and picking fights. Biscuits and baked beans where they don't belong. Sit on down with Corey and Trey and learn some fancy shit. Today we'll laugh a little even when they're wrong. They'll take you to a magical place where if you call someone a cut, nobody cares. They keep it debonair at putting on airs, putting on airs, putting on airs, putting on airs. And MLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults, a spring break from house payments. Savewithconrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months at savewithconrad.com.